Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey along with Anthony Broom. We are back from Chicago, back in the great state of Michigan. Feels good to be back. I wish we got to stay a little bit longer in Chicago. We, Anthony, we left before they even dyed the river green, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so that sucks. Didn't have any green beers this weekend, as we discussed beforehand. But we are back. Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us here on a Friday. We're usually coming to you on Thursday, but we are brought to you by My Perfect Franchise. Are you ready to leave the corporate rat race for the American dream? Looking for a side hustle while working your current job? Want to diversify, build wealth, and or leave a legacy? Andy can help. Andy is a franchise consultant as well as franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets, financial requirements, time to commit, and more. His services are 100% free, and he's here to help if you have any questions about business ownership, uh, hit up Andy, Lud- Andy Ludke uh, at www.myperfectfranchise.net. Uh, you can also call him at 404-973-9901. Email him, Andy, at myperfectfranchise.net. You can book time with him on his calendar on the website there. So go and check out Andy. Uh, he's been a great partner. We sat down with him a couple weeks ago, actually. He gave us the, the lay of the land, and uh, he's doing some great stuff over there. So we appreciate him sponsoring this show. Uh, Anthony, Michigan basketball loses 62 to 50 to Rutgers on Thursday in the Big Ten tournament, eight nine game, second straight year where Michigan loses its first game in the Big Ten tournament. They had gone 14 years without doing that, which is an incredible feat. But it, it really what made the Big Ten tournament such a fun event for Michigan fans and, and media to cover for so many years, including Juwan Howard's first Big Ten tournament uh, in 2021. You lose two in a row uh, in those first ones, but this one much more disappointing than even the Indiana one a year ago, which is hard to say, uh, you know, or crazy to say because of just how crazy that game was. 17 point lead in the second half, you blow it. But this Rutgers game, uh, extremely disappointing. Michigan goes into this event thinking one win, you're going to watch that selection show, you're going to have a chance. Two wins, you're probably in. That would include a win over Purdue. Three wins, obviously, you know, you're pushing for a Big Ten tournament championship at that point. You are no longer on the bubble. Instead, Michigan lays an egg in this second half. I mean, they came out. Hunter Dickinson was was really sharp, I thought, early on in the game. Michigan couldn't hit a jump shot. They weren't so good on the defensive glass. They were turning it over a little bit too much. But, you know, I thought once they start hitting some shots, you know, usually they clean up the turnovers when, when they're going bad in the first half. And, you know, maybe you get on the defensive glass a little bit better. But then it turns into a a total bizarro game. They can't hit a shot in the second half. They had only one field goal through 19 minutes of that half. And, you know, a bunch of free throws. So that that factors in as well. But one of the weirdest games I have seen. And by the end, Michigan is essentially blown out by Rutgers, uh, a Rutgers team that was desperate itself. Um, Man, tell me your, your thoughts about this game. I can't say my unfiltered thoughts on here. That wouldn't be appropriate. Come on. Um, do it for the, the nicest. The nicest way I can put it is that game in a season full of wet fart performances. And there were plenty of them was probably <laughs> the wettest, stinkiest fart of them all, Ugh. especially that second half. Um, there were several times you and I were uh, stationed high atop. United Center, uh, bird's eye view of the action as as tens of fans of both teams took in that game yesterday. And at a certain point in that second half, we just looked at each other and we're like, I, I've never seen anything like this. Like, like they're scoring points. And you're like, really? It's been that long without a field goal? And you look at the stat broadcast and you look at the scoring, it was all free throws. And, you know, to me, I'm sure we'll, I'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it here, but the, uh, the most viral moment of that game was the the Jet Howard not boxing out during a free throw while you're down, you know, uh, sets up like this. Derek Simpson from Rutgers goes to the free throw line. Michigan's down 40 to 39, kind of hanging tough. Um, you know, it was it was one of those classic Michigan Rutgers bar fight type of games. And Derek Simpson goes to the line, misses his first or makes his first free throw, misses his second free throw. And normally you're taught in elementary school basketball that you have to box out if on a missed free throw and someone has to take the shooter. 
Well, nobody took the shooter. Uh, Jed Howard was supposed to take the shooter. And Derek Simpson rebounds his own miss and drives the lane for an uncontested layup. All of a sudden, Michigan, or, you know, you're sitting there, Michigan's down 43 39, and that kicks off a 12 0 run. Guess what? You lost by 12 points. Um, I have been hesitant to do the whole, to do the Jet Howard blame game routine. Uh, it wasn't a good performance for him. Make no mistake about it. And that type of play was the microcosm of his season as an individual and also Michigan season in general and the lack of making enough winning plays in those big time moments. But Kobe Bufkin played probably his worst game of the year. He had seven turnovers. Doug McDaniel had two points. Nobody, everyone not named Hunter Dickinson played one of their worst games that they've ever played in the biggest game that they've played all year. This is a win and in situation, not win and in, but win and you're at least watching the selection show on Sunday. Uh, last year it was, you know, Michigan loses and at least, you know, at least you're going, well, I guess, I guess they're going to Dayton. And then this game was more of a, well, if they win, maybe they go to Dayton, but if they win and then play, maybe play well against Purdue on Friday, who knows? Maybe they're in the NCAA tournament. I think that that would have been enough for them to get there. Um, in a season full of missed opportunities, this was the most probably I hesitate to say the most disheartening because CMU was a quad four loss and definitely would fall yeah. into that uh, category. But um, that was, that was upsetting. And you and I also said this, you know, you, if you lose that game to Rutgers, there's no real shame in that. It's an eight, nine game. You're fairly evenly matched. We know how difficult this conference has been, but to lose it that way. And the best way I could describe it was the way I said to you, it, it, they lost in such a way to where you're you're disinterested in watching basketball the rest of the day. You're disinterested in like watching the rest of the Big Ten tournament. Of course, um, you know you get a night's sleep and that take changes. Of course, but uh, yeah, just disappointing, upsetting. Um, I'll say unacceptable because one basket in 19 minutes of a half is I've never seen anything like that, and that's. Uh, it's going to be a long off season. I can't even begin to speculate on what comes next because we don't know. We don't know what changes will be made uh, to the roster, any potential staff changes, but we think there's going to be an NIT and I guess we got to get up to cover that now, which I'm not crazy about, but that's the spot this team is in and they put themselves there. Yeah. A couple of things about the matchup is coming into this game. When you looked at Rutgers in general and, and what had happened in the first meeting in Piscataway just a couple weeks earlier and Michigan wins that game by 13 points is the guards were so good in that game. Doug McDaniel, Kobe Bufkin, they combined for 30 points. They were both, you know, Doug McDaniel disappeared in this game. Kobe Bufkin, some of the passes he made, a lot of them one-handed, a lot of them terrible decisions. I, I really couldn't believe it because that was not Kobe Bufkin's game all year long. He was smart. He didn't never force the issue. He was a smooth operator in there. And then it was the exact opposite. Um, you know, I thought Michigan got a little bit too reliant on Hunter Dickinson going to the post, but at the same time, I mean, that's all they had. So it was kind of this circular thing where, yeah, maybe they were too reliant on it. It didn't let anybody else get going, but they were doing it because nobody else could make a shot. Then I thought Hunter Dickinson pressed a little bit too much. Um, you know, he was trying to go up over two guys, three guys. Uh, that forced some turnovers. He should have probably kicked it out. But at the end of the day, do I really blame Hunter uh, when when he kicked it out? He didn't see the ball back again. And a lot of times it resulted in a missed shot or a bad pass or something else that went terribly wrong. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of the way this went. I, I found this interesting, too. Like, I was just thinking about Michigan's – the way Michigan has gone out the last three seasons uh, – and, you know, obviously the two before were were very good runs that they made in the NCAA tournament to the Elite Eight in the Sweet 16. But it is kind of odd or, you know, I don't know if there's any conclusion to draw from it, but you look at the UCLA game in the Elite Eight, they ran basically everything through the post. Nobody could make a shot. They made only three shots outside of the paint in that game. The Villanova game in the Sweet 16 last year, they couldn't make a layup. That included Hunter Dickinson. So the, obviously it's not like, I'm saying this is, you know, Hunter Dickinson and everybody else is to blame, but it just felt like they were force feeding the post. They couldn't make a jump shot. Only seven shots in that game made outside the paint. And then in this game, seven shots outside the paint made for Michigan from the field. Um, and, you know, 
they just didn't have enough help. And to me, I thought that Michigan got demoralized when the shots didn't go in. You know, the they and then they started to look confused on the offensive end. Rutgers, on the other hand, they couldn't make anything early on. I thought Michigan defended well, but when they got open looks, nothing. And I remember saying this to you, uh, I believe, where it's like, man, if Cam Spencer is going to miss that open three, I don't know how Rutgers is going to score this game. Uh, but at the same time, I also said this, Rutgers was used to that. Rutgers was not phased by missing shots because, frankly, they have a terrible offense and they just <laughs> keep playing, and that's what Rutgers does. And then Steve Peichel – gets on the ground and starts pounding on the floor, uh, pumping up his guys. Well, you know, Jawan Howard looks stoic on the sideline. His players look shook, um, you know, and that's kind of the way this game went. I thought Rutgers adjusted to what was happening in the game. Michigan didn't. And I thought, you know, eventually, you know, eventually I thought there was a chance Michigan was going to make a run. But in hindsight, that thing was over from the minute Derek Simpson made that layup, as you mentioned in that moment. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of, how things went and you go out with an absolute whimper uh, in, in, you know, I, I'm not going to say vibes were great going into the big 10 tournament, but there was a heck of an opportunity in front of them. And that was super disappointing. Uh, Jet Howard, me and you were on here on Monday and we were talking about jet and we both said, you know, he has a lot of moments that are teachable moments to put it lightly. Uh, but at the same time, he does lift this team's offensive ceiling. He does a lot of good things. He can make a lot of shots. The Indiana game, he made a bunch of mistakes, but he hit four threes. He, I think he outscored maybe the mistakes that he gave up. But when he doesn't do that, like he didn't against Rutgers, he can become a real issue. Um, you know, just just some, you know, flat out laziness. I mean, or I, I don't know what you would call it on the, the box out there, but there were other moments he was lost on defense. It's like he decided to take a, a possession off. Um, so as as people who have been saying, yeah, like Jet Howard has his issues and this team has its issue, issues when he's in the game. Uh, but, you know, not everything is, is on him. Yesterday was not the performance that, that people like us needed to, to try to convince people otherwise. I thought he was one of the biggest problems with what happened yesterday. And the fact that he didn't come out and he wasn't held accountable and he still played 36 minutes, given kind of what went on there, I thought was pretty disheartening as well. And, and maybe, you know, shows maybe a, a bigger issue that, that this team had. I'm going to, I, I want to be very deliberate with how I put this here. Cause I respect the guy I'm about to make this comparison to, but you know, if all you can do is shoot and you're not, you know, you're not grabbing rebounds and you're not defending and you're not doing simple basketball plays, um, you know, you're late era Duncan Robinson and you have to come off the bench because I can't play you for 30 minutes like that. Um, now part of the issue with, you know, holding some, you know, holding any of these players accountable is that their depth is putrid. And I, I, I hate to say it that way because, you know, the, you know, I like the guys on the team and I think everyone's kind of had their fair share of moments, but they don't have the depth to hold guys accountable. Um, you know, you can't, but what uh, about what, what if it's 30 seconds? What if it's a minute? Yeah, what if it's one? You're right. And, 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 and like you've said a million times, John Beeline used to do that with Trey Burke all the time. He'd take him out for um, 30 seconds. You know, even if it was just a quick message to him and it's yeah. not punishing jet to take him out necessarily. It's more, Hey, it's if you don't, good for, this is just it's the way good it goes. for basketball players yeah. to, to have those conversations. I mean, yeah, for as much as we, you know, we rip Tom Izzo for his, uh, and I'm just using, it's the first thing that popped in my head. You know, he will, he'll pull you off the floor and chew your ass out. If you're not he just doing that to job. Hogard this afternoon, he had him on the yeah. bench for a few minutes. Um, Hogard did not look very happy that he was getting yelled at and Hogard played decent down the stretch, but sometimes you just need a, you just need that quick, hard reset. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of turning your computer on or turning it off and turning it back on when things are a little bit buggy. Um, I think that the overarching issue, not just with this jet situation, but with this team, uh, even going back to last year, uh, you know, th that sweet 16 run last year, you know, clouded that, those seasons were kind of similar. Now that team had um, I thought was, was better in a few areas, obviously had some better wins, but the fact of the matter is that when this, this team and this program has not made enough adjustments, um, you know, Hunter Dickinson was feasting in the first half of that game. They go in the locker room. Steve Peichel comes out and sends the kitchen sink at Hunter Dickinson and everything falls apart for Michigan and nothing changes in their, the way they approach it. I mean, they were, I can't even call it 
like freelancing. I mean, it's just, there was no rhyme or reason to anything they were doing offensively. Um, you know, the most disheartening thing about this year is that uh, I think there's been a leadership problem. And I think that you haven't made the big adjustment in a big moment. You know, they lost, what was it? Five games that they had, you know, more than an 80% in game chance of, of, or win probability uh, per, we talked about that earlier this week. Um, I'm sorry, that's coaching and that's adjustments. And that is having a feel for the game, having a feel for lineups. Um, you know, I talk about the lack of leadership and the lack of accountability. Um, you know, every season has that moment that you'll always remember. And for me, the one that will endure from this year, um, it's not over yet. Maybe they win the NIT and that becomes the moment that's seared into my brain. Um, but it's going to be, you know, you lose a game against Central Michigan and Jace Howard is sitting up there talking to the media. It's not Hunter Dickinson. It's not Jet Howard. It's not Terrence Williams. Um, it's Jace. And I like Jace. That's nothing against him. But, you know, your your best players have to be the rising tides that lift everyone else. And that just hasn't happened enough this year. And that's... Um, it's been disappointing, and I've I don't want to harp on it. again. I want I want to say this. I'm not suggesting Juwan Howard should be fired. I don't think he you know if you want to say his seat's getting a little bit warm, that's fine. Um, but there's a lot of soul searching that needs to take place this off season. If they're if they're heading to the NIT, which we suspect they are, it's got to start with a conversation of if you have one foot out the door right now, you may as well have two. We want to play the guys who want to be out there, who want to get better, who want to help us win some games, win some games in a postseason situation. Um, I think that's, you know, there needs to be, there's just not enough attention, you know, effort, attention to def- uh, detail and, and frankly, buy in, you know, you could like someone and not totally buy in. Like it's not, it, I don't think there's some big culture problem or some rift, uh, but something's missing there. I don't know what it is, but, it's going to be a long off season to try and figure it out. We were at dinner last night in Chicago at a, a great Italian restaurant with Jeff Schiller, M Hoops One, on the mm-hmm. Fort, our premium message board over at thewolverine.com, uh, who always provides tons of insight, Chris Ballas. Um, and we were talking about, you know, the leadership on this team. Like, I don't think Hunter is a bad leader. I think Hunter Dickinson is a pretty good leader, probably, for this team. He's a great player, obviously. Jace Howard may be a good leader. Um, you know, Terrence Williams might be a good leader, but sometimes you need a Zach Novak, a Charles Matthews, a Xavier Simpson, somebody who's going to not let their teammates make the type of mistakes that this Michigan team made over and over and over again. And maybe if Hunter comes back and, and he's a senior, uh, you know, that he's going to kind of flip that switch and decide that, hey, enough's enough. Like, I'm not coming back to just be mediocre. I'm coming back to – play great basketball, have a great team. Uh, and, you know, maybe it'll take that extra year for him to kind of turn into that guy. I think it's hard when you're a big guy sometimes. I think, you know, a lot of times it needs to be the you know guy who has the ball in his hands a little bit more. Even Eli Brooks in his own way wasn't necessarily a Xavier Simpson or a Charles Matthews, but Eli Brooks in his own way I think had a way of making sure other guys like Caleb Houston, who did improve throughout the year, especially on defense, uh, and other guys held accountable – knew what to do, uh, which is another thing that this team at times, you know, at times it looked like a low IQ basketball team. Uh, You know, I hate to say it, but that's just kind of the way I saw it. And, you know, so I think that's going to help. I think getting a year older is going to help, Um, you know, but there's so much uncertainty about this roster as well. We're at dinner last night talking about that. And and I got questions. Uh, I was on the radio before the game and, I was asked, well, what's this team going to look like next year? And I was like, I, I can't answer that question right now because there's so much uncertainty with college basketball in general. But Michigan's roster, you have Kobe Bufkin, Jet Howard. They're going to go through NBA draft decisions. Hunter Dickinson, by no means does, does it feel like he's settled on what he's going to do next season. I mean, would you be totally shocked if he decided to go play overseas? Would you be shocked if he decided to go to the NBA draft? Would you be shocked if he... Uh, you know, if there's some back channel where somebody tries to offer him a ton of money and he enters a transfer portal, I wouldn't be shocked. I think the most likely scenario is Hunter will be back, but that's a big if. And Juwan Howard, I think it's kind of number one on the checklist for me if I'm Juwan Howard going into this offseason. 
but um, they got to figure out the leadership aspect. Getting older will help there, as, as I said. But, um, you know, right now there's some soul searching that needs to be done. Part of me, though, is like I'm a little conflicted on does there need to be a hard reset or does there, you know, is it one of these things where, yeah, they're probably in the tournament if they're a little bit older, if they win a couple of the close games they lost. And I know it's a bunch of ifs, but, you know, that's kind of the way some seasons go. Does it need to be a reset um, or does it need to just kind of be one of those things where you keep pushing, you keep doing the things you're doing, trust your culture, trust what you've built. Uh, Anthony, I want you to answer that question right after we do a read from our friends at Price. You crested us. That was that was professional right there by me. <laughs> Credit to me. Um, it's basketball season. March Madness is beginning. Michigan may still have some games to go. It does pain me to read that part of the ad read, but there isn't a better way to enjoy watching your favorite team than by playing daily fantasy with our friends at prize picks. Prize picks is the simplest form of real money, daily fantasy sports and just pits you against the numbers at prize picks. You are not competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Whether you're a fantasy sports nut or a casual fan looking to add some excitement to the games, prize picks is the perfect game for you. They offer projections on any sport you can watch. So if you're kind of depressed about college basketball, there's plenty to choose from. NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, eSports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and many more. It's the best way to have action on the game in states like Michigan, Kentucky, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Georgia, and over 70% of the United States. Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada not Ontario, you simply select two to five players and predict if they will go more or less than their prize picks projection. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. Uh, AB, there may be some people listening to this after this game happens, so maybe they can uh, you know, see how I did in these picks. But this week I have Boo Booey, Northwestern point guard, more than 18 and a half points against Penn State tonight in the Big Ten tournament. And Jalen Pickett, Penn State point guard, more than 16 and a half points. I think it's going to be a really good matchup uh, between both those teams and both of those point guards. Hutch, in the background, our great producer, gives a thumbs up because he's a Penn State fan. His team still dancing this weekend, and they will be heading to the NCAA tournament. Uh, but what do you have, Anthony, this week as far as your prize picks? Yeah, uh, sticky with basketball. I know I've switched it up at times um, over the last couple of weeks. First one's a f- – uh, an NBA pick, James Harden, more than these are all more than's. Uh, I've, I've hit pretty well on the more than's this year. Uh, James Harden, more than 22 and a half points against the Portland Trail Blazers. And then now that Michigan's out of the NCAA tournament picture, I'm going to be honing in on these teams that um, more of these teams that I kind of like heading into March Madness. One of them is UConn, uh, who I think is probably one of the favorites to make a run in this whole thing. Uh, Adama Sonogo more than 15 and a half points uh, on Friday against Marquette. That's a top 10 game, I believe. Um, and Anthony Black of Arkansas, one of my favorite uh, favorite players in college basketball right now. I'm going with more than 12 and a half points for him against Texas A&M. So uh, by the time you see this, uh, we'll see how these picks did, but I encourage you to make yours and get in on it. Let us know what you went with. Yeah, no doubt. I get a couple DMs a week, it seems like, on our message board with people saying, hey, I have this pick. Uh, I've taken a few of those, so I appreciate those people giving me those winners. Uh, but download the Prize Picks app or head to prizepicks.com. Use the promo code Wolverine to get an instant 100% bonus up to $100 on your first deposit. So if you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. So they match you right there. So don't forget that's the Prize Picks app or prizepicks.com. And the code Wolverine for that instant 100% bonus up to $100 on your first deposit. Uh, Anthony, I did the teaser, you know, credit to me for that. Um, but just kidding. But hard reset for you? Or is this one of those things? And it could be a combination. I mean, here's the thing not to go on a tangent, but like Jim Harbaugh was asked down at the Fiesta Bowl, uh, you know, what happened after 2020? How did you guys kind of turn things around? And, you know, part of his answer was, hey, you know, we just kept pushing, kept doing the things we were doing. He also replaced six of his 10 assistant coaches. He revamped his recruiting department uh, from the, you know, he brought in Biff Pogey from the sounds of it. He, he became a little bit more 
personable with the players, a little bit more involved, gave them a little bit more input. So he made changes. But also, I see his point where it's like, yeah, you know, we've always made changes, but we continue to just kind of push. So it can be a combination. Uh, and I think that's probably what Michigan needs. But for you, hard reset, you know, is this something where you may have to shake some things up? Or maybe it's the same staff or, you know, in the same, uh, you know, core of players, but it's changing the way you do things. Uh, or is this one of those things where, hey, they're going to be a year older if they get guys back? You know, they should be good. And maybe you kind of return to the form that you would like. And hopefully for Michigan fans, it's it's a non-bubble team and, you know, a team that competes for the Big Ten Championship. Yeah. Again, I think that a lot of these things can uh, – <laughs> uh, hard reset seems harsh because that means you're blowing everything up, right? Um, but I think that there needs to be kind of a re-emphasis on the recruiting trail. I think that Michigan can certainly pick it up there in that regard. I mean, I like the guys that they're bringing in for next year, but I'm sorry, George Washington and, and Papa Conte aren't guys that are really going to move the needle for – I mean, they could set a higher floor for what next year's team is, but they're not really going to push your ceiling ahead. So need to get, need to bring in some guys that are going to be impactful um, need to increase. I mean, the depth just has to get better and really, I mean, they got to get some, this is the way I put it at dinner last night. This is the way I put it in the article I wrote earlier this morning. They have to go out and get a few red asses that burn to win. And that's what that 2020 uh, 2021 team had. I mean, Isaiah Livers, Sean D. Brown, uh, Eli Brooks, you know, the list goes on and on of those types of players that they, um, none of those guys are on this roster right now. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, Hunter could be that guy. There are guys that could be that guy, but um, it's sim, it feels, it feels similar to that 2020 football season where again, not as much of a disaster, obviously that year had an asterisk next to it, but still, a lot of the problems that they had were to me, a lot of paper cuts that built up over the couple of years that preceded it. And that's by and large, how I feel about, about this year. I mean, it's, I don't think just going back into the lab and getting, seeing if you can just get 1% better every day is, is, is how you do it here. I mean, we'll see what happens with the coaching staff. I mean, there's the elephant in the room is who knows how much longer Phil Martelli uh, is going to choose to, um, you know, coach the game of basketball. I think that he has uh, some happy retirement years ahead of him. We'll see what happens there. Um, Saudi's been around for a long time. Howard Isley, um, just I can, no offense to him, just hasn't given them much on the recruiting trail. It doesn't seem like so. For me, I, I think any and all options are on the table. Um, so I, again, it's it's more of a look inward. It's more of a look into your process. What's led you here? Um, and it's just accountability. I mean, I, I, I think that Juwan coaches them hard. I do. I believe that. And you know, they're these are competitive practices too. I mean, we were talking last year to those guys on the team, and they're saying in camp they have black eyes and busted lips. But um, maybe a little, maybe maybe just getting back to the fundamentals of the game. You know, I, I hate to sound like old guy here, but uh, well, you are thirty you know, now, so. <laughs> All right, we can wrap this up here. Um, yeah, I mean, hard reset. I mean, we're our, it's semantics, but yeah, I mean, what I've seen this year was a lot of ways an, an extension of what last year was. And uh, I, I just think that the way that, particularly the way it ended in Chicago was eye-opening enough for me to say, listen, I mean, yeah, you know, you can, you can take stretches of the season at any moment. Say, well, you know, you win this game here, win this game there. Fact of the matter is, when it was all said and done, and you needed literally just one win, probably one more win to put yourself on the bubbles, um, they lost five of their last eight games, uh, and that's it's not good enough. Um, we'll see what happens, but it's hard to even speculate on what comes next because I really do think the any and all options, both on the good and on the bad side, are on the table here. I I, I just don't know what to expect. Yeah, I I think. Here's one thing on Phil Martelli. I think he's going to stick around at least another year. Jawan Howard talked about this a few weeks ago, but it sounds like they're trying to um, schedule a game against Penn State at the Palestra, oh, the historic UPenn Arena in Philly, and he said he wants to give Phil Martelli that opportunity. So to me, 
indicates that they've kind of have a have a plan there. Phil is living, I believe, by himself um, in Ann Arbor, and then you know the wife comes and visits every now and then. But that that is tough, you know, for for somebody who's especially for him too. He's lived in Philly like his entire life, um, so that is challenging. But it will be interesting to me to see what Jawan Howard does. Will he make a, a staff change? You know, I don't, I don't necessarily think he should. I don't necessarily think he will. But I think there's a possibility always and or will, you know, maybe somebody move on and, and it has to force him to maybe change something up. I'll be watching that definitely uh, as, as kind of the offseason comes. I want to talk about the NIT in a second, because technically we may be back at Chrysler on Tuesday covering a game, which just is surreal. Uh, thinking about that last night, I'm, I'm in Chicago thinking about the fact that I may be sitting in the media row at Chrysler center after I had already kind of said goodbye on senior day and said, Hey, we'll see you next year. Um, but anyway, so the changes that could be made, I, I think I'm with you. And I was going to say this before you brought it up, but the fundamentals, the details with this team, it just felt like that was lacking. Again, those are things that will come with time. When you bring in a Doug McDaniel, you don't expect your point guard, especially when you run a complex system to get everything right off the bat. But at the same time, and, and Doug progressed. I'm not even, you know, he's just one example. But the whole team, you know, it just felt like some of the things they did wrong back in December, yeah, they improved throughout the year. But eventually they came back to bite them at different points throughout the season, which was disappointing. And they didn't quite take that next step. They were playing well, I thought, in February, even in their two losses to Illinois and Indiana last week. I thought they played well for the most part in those games. But you never fixed the glaring issues about late game situations. You never fixed. Um, and I think you put it well, where it's like you, you plug one hole, but then something else pops up. You know, th- yeah. they had they were a good defensive rebounding team for most of the season statistically, but there were some games where that was the reason why they lost. And then they would improve on that the next game, but then it would pop up again two weeks later, and it would lose them a game. That sort of thing, where you know they just didn't fully take that step. Um, John Beeline, you know, was maybe the most detail-oriented coach of all time. You know, I remember guys talking about how they would literally spend an entire practice catching the ball on two feet, pivoting. I mean, who who practices pivoting? But things like that, that at the end of the day, like those add up when you're not fundamentally sound. And then it will lead to something like we saw yesterday, uh, you know, something like we we've seen over the last couple of years where you're only a few games over 500, you're only six games over 500 the last two seasons against high major teams. I believe you're under 500. I don't know the exact number there, but you know, something's got to change at, at that point. Um, anything else before I ask you another question, which, which I'll tease right now is should they accept an NIT bid? Uh, and maybe what do you want to see out of that? But anything else before we move on to that? Yeah, I would just, I would kind of just sum up all of what you just said by, you have, you can, you can apply a lesson. You can learn a hard lesson, but you have to stick to it. Right. Like when you um, it's the fundamentals, right. And, and ultimately you're going to play the way that you, the habits that you develop in games are stuff that is either practiced or not practiced over the course of a year. So um, yeah, I mean, I know. So again, Juwan comes from an NBA background where like, it's just assumed that you have all of that stuff down. You know how to box out on a free throw. You know how to grab a rebound. You know, you know, you know, those basic things. Um, So when you practice, it's a lot of, it's more kind of skill development. It's not so much dribbling a basketball or learning how to use your pivot foot. Um, And we don't see many, the only, we see practice once a year and they basically just do the three man weave let us get some B-roll and then kick us the hell out of there. And I'm not, so, yeah, but, I'm not saying they're not doing that stuff, but it, yeah, I know you're it, not. it doesn't seem like whatever they're doing, it, it has translated. You know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, well, those are the habits, and they say right? he's, They say he's a detail-oriented coach, a lot of the players. And I believe well, it I to don't, a certain extent. Yeah. It's either not getting through or it's not being taught. And neither of those are right. good options, right? We see the product, so, right? And, and that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. You are what you put on, you know, you could have the best practices in the history of the world. Oh God. Great. How many times on the football side of things have we heard? God, Brady you know, you, you know, you lose a game by three touchdowns and you're like, I thought we had a great week of practice. Right. And it's Brady Hope. your film is <laughs> your film is what you put on the court or on the field. And what you see is what you, what you've, you know, what you see is what you get right now. So, um, 
that would be the long and short, well, not the short of it, but more on the, the details for me. No doubt. I think that's a great way to put it. So last thing, we'll end with this, and you know, we'll probably be back Monday potentially previewing a game that is the next day, which is crazy. I was hoping that would be the case with Dayton. You know, maybe we were previewing a trip. The Wolverine takes Dayton. You know, I hear it's a beautiful town. You know, I know kids that went to Dayton, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, you know, so we'll talk about more Michigan basketball on Monday. But NIT, um, I think they should accept the bid. And I think, you know, here's the thing. You're a young team. Jawan Howard keeps reiterating how they're a young team. And they are. They rank 310th in the country in Division One experience, according to Ken Palm. Uh, he brought it up again yesterday after the loss. He said, it's not an excuse, but we are a young team. He always kind of uses that preface. It's, this is not an excuse, but uh, we are a young team. And it's just a fact. You know, I wouldn't necessarily call it an excuse myself. But, hey, then if we can get some experience, let's go get some experience. You're for competitors only, you know, and, and if you think that Michigan's above the NIT, which I think it is in, in this sense, the fact that they've had such a good tradition over the last 15 years of making the NCAA tournament, not only that, but winning 23 NCAA tournament games over the last 10 years tied for the second most, by the way, with North Carolina, uh, who is also going to miss the tournament. Villanova is going to miss the tournament. Wisconsin's going to miss the tournament. So, uh, I don't know if there's ever been a tournament without those four teams or whatever, or how long it's been. Thanks, North Carolina, for a lot of that. Um, but, you know, you're not above it because this is what you've gotten. This is the situation you got yourself into. These are the brutal facts of your current reality is that you're 17 and 15 on the wrong side of the bubble heading into Selection Sunday. So I think you accept the bid. I think you get your youth some experience. And... I think maybe you open up the rotation a little bit, see what you have in Yusef Kayat. We talked about that at dinner last night. We should have just slapped the recorder down on the table, Anthony. And got that, that was the podcast. The I mean, all we were podcast. missing was our ad reads. Yeah, we were so. drinking some Long Island iced teas, uh, some Stella <laughs> Artois, and, uh, and having some fun with it. So, um, you know, I, I think you open the rotation a, l- a little bit, and you try to win that damn thing, go to Vegas. You know, I know – it's always that thing when the team celebrates winning the NIT. I feel like it always goes viral every year because it's like, what do you do? Do you celebrate? You were playing good basketball if you win the NIT. Those are still teams that were all like basically on the bubble. And, you know, it, it can be a valuable experience for a team. Uh, your thoughts on the National Invitational Tournament? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like if you are if you are for competitors only, right, you accept the bid and you go. And, um, as, as, as pouty as I, as we might be for having to cover it, um, compared to how these last couple of years have gone, where we're talking about deep NCAA tournament runs, there's a time like this, you know, I want to see those young guys play. I want to see Doug McDaniel in a tournament setting. Um, you know, this is a group, you know, Juwan warts and all has been pretty good on a short turnaround, um, since he's been at Michigan. So, yeah, I mean, if you're going to be in it, you may as well win it, right? Like that's it's as simple as that. Build up some equity uh, in your future, get to the offseason with some shred of momentum. I mean, if if this is this is about as dour a note as you could end the season on if there isn't any basketball after this. So, pick up the pieces, uh find a way to play, you know, whatever it is. I think you would play what, four games, five games in the NIT potentially. Sounds um, right. Yeah, go I gotta, out there. I got to read it. up. I got to read up on this damn tournament. <laughs> I've never, I've never, uh, I've never, never covered one before. So, yeah, um, saddest Long Island iced tea I've ever had. By the way, uh, at dinner last night, uh, the waiter. Go- I was just he's taking drink orders. Sorry for story time here. And I was like, yeah, I'll have an iced tea. And the waiter just goes Long Island, and I'm like, why not? What the it hell? Was that kind of day. So, and then. Clayton doubled down and did your brother get one too? I forget. Yeah. The, uh, we had just a row of sad Long Island iced teas, um, a year (laughs) after a sad steak dinner, uh, in Indianapolis after another wildly frustrating big 10 tournament game. So I don't like that's become a tradition, but at least the company's all right. That's you couldn't put it better. Uh, yeah, (laughs) I sat down, I saw, I was like, what are you drinking? It's like Long Island iced tea. All right, give me one. So that's kind of how it went. But, um, yeah, we uh, that is the Michigan basketball Big Ten 
tournament. Uh, we will see what happens after this. Uh, but that's going to be our show. We're going to leave it there. Much more to come on Monday. We got spring football, all of that going on. They're back in action. Uh, there'll be six practices in at that point, and uh, we will chat about that. Make sure to hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Thanks for doing that. We are climbing towards 22,000 subscribers, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Hit the thumbs up, the like button there. If you hope the Michigan football team wins the national championship next year. So if you don't hit the thumbs up, it means you do not want Michigan football to win the national championship. The only people that will not hit the thumbs up are the the Sparty lurkers that are happy that Michigan lost in the Big Ten tournament. But so, so did they, I guess. So um, thanks for doing that. And head to the Wolverine.com. Follow all of our coverage there. Michigan football, basketball, recruiting, $29.99 gets you premium access all the way until August 31st. Thanks so much, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. For more videos from the Wolverine, whether it be football, basketball, recruiting, live shows, and more, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel for the latest.